Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Gary. Uh, so a little bit about myself before I start talking about uh, transactional emails. So I'm, uh, I'm working at Trigger as a software engineer. Uh, I've been uh, working here for like almost five years and actually started learning Ruby when I joined Trigger um, and even though I've been here for like five years, I've been to these meetups for long, for multiple times, I guess. I guess, and then this is actually the first time that I uh, I decided to give a little, like talk in uh, in the meetup, Ruby meetup. So uh, please be gentle. Um, <laughs> okay. Oh. So um, so we're not hiring. Uh, <laughs> just to make sure uh, we're clear on that. Okay, we're actually hiring. <laughs> so, um, if you're interested in like um, joining us, it, diploma team or like um, non technical team in Trigeco, you can check out Trigeco slash jobs. Um, you have all um, you have all the information there. So okay. So let's start. Um, so like this talk is will be more about tips about transactional emails. Um, and most of these tips comes from um, uh, when we were actually fighting against these spammers. Um, so as an inventory system, like we, um, we send lots of transactional emails. So for example, when someone, um, once some, someone creates an order, we send them an email and then it's usually on behalf of the um, on the behalf of the, the users, our customers usually. And um, I find that there are lots of um, in articles in the internet about um, transactional emails, but it's about how to set up transactional emails, but never about like, these are the best practices, and then this is how you um, uh, protect yourself against the spammers. So um, like the tips that I give you is not very um, advanced, it's like simple, but I think Sometimes, when in terms of emails, what we do is actually we set it up, um, and then we forget about it. It's, even though like emails is probably very important for our customers, um, we don't think about it that much, like compared to, for example, how um, how we do our controllers or how we do um, our background jobs and that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, so that's why. Um, uh, that's where um, why I wanted to give like these five tips. So, um, if I can help you with these tips, then um, that's basically um, what I wanted to get from this talk. Sorry, do you want to use a full screen presentation? Um, I think this is full screen, and let me check. Uh, um, control command. Control command F, okay. Yeah? Okay. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think you should be the host and then not me. <laughs> okay, I should figure that one out. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So um just to start off, like what is transactional email? So um just uh, one simple example is that um, someone registered to your um, to your app and then they want to invite somebody in the in the um, in that app so just add team member and then your app will send invitation email so basically transactional emails are emails that is being triggered by the user interaction in the app what are not Transactional emails, things like marketing emails, or like if there's if you're sending like summary of your sales every month, and those are not transactional emails. But transactional emails is something that the user can trigger by um, interaction in your app. So this is like very simple. Like in your Rails app, usually um, you know there's a user controller, and then when you create new user, and then you send the user mailer. So this is, I think you've seen this um, uh, in your uh, Rails app as well. And like when, when the app is still small, um, like you're us usually just like setting up like your Gmail um, address and then using those 
as your um, SMTP. And then like at that point, like the email deliverability or like the reputation of the email that is not really important for you. So um, like you trust your customers that or your users that they will send um, like uh, things that that will not be accounted as spam. And then if like in this case, like it will work if you only sending from like one single email address, like you have, I don't know, we have like notification at tradegeggle.com or but if you want to send to uh, using different email address, then um, this will be a problem. Um, so when delivery becomes uh, more important, like you look at this kind of services. You look at things like SNS, uh, AWS SNS, uh, SendGrid, Postmark, Mailgun. Um, so like the reason why you go to these services is because like if you want to send 10,000 emails um, a month, like this, uh, like their service is uh, really good at doing that. And like if you're doing it on your own, then you probably have uh, problems doing it. And then, um, and also what they do really well is try to optimize your deliverability and also your um, email reputation. So what they do usually is um, if they know that the email address that they're sending to um, will has high probability that will mark your email address as spam, then they will actually pre-block that, that email. Um, so uh, yeah, they do like all the, that kind of smart stuff. And like in, this is in SendGrid, they will have like suppressions lists. So um, things like it, if there's spam reports and blocks invalid, um, they will list, list out those lists for you. And then basically if another email address that is in the suppressions list, then they will just not send it. And that means that your email reputations will not go bad. So, but like these services, they always charge by a month of emails. So like in here, like um, the, the most basic SendGrid plan is, um, gives you 400,000 uh, emails a month. And then if you uh, go through that threshold, then um, basically for every thousand emails, you will like pay $1. So it's the same with, uh, this is I think Mailgun. Um, it's half the price, but the same concept. So if you don't keep track of your usage, then like, you know, the, this, the cost of sending email can blow up. Um, so this is something that we also um, struggle with, which is um, what happens if there's a spike in uses? What happens if suddenly your, your app just starts sending 10,000 emails in a day where in like, usually on normal day it's like only 100? Then like depends on what kind of email service provider um, you're using, like they will, uh, they will have a certain threshold and they will suspend your account. And that means that when your account is suspended then uh, you cannot send any emails. And um, so, um, in that case, um, this is my first tip for um, transactional email, which is like don't rely on one email service provider. Um, so, uh, like this is especially for um, us developers in in Southeast Asia, um, trying to get your account reactivated it will take a long time. Um, just, so the process of reactivating your account is usually you need to email their support account to the support team, and then they try to figure out what, what's wrong with, with your, um, with your uh, email, and then why are you sending so many email, emails in, in a day? And then if they need to verify that the issue is not there anymore. But if um, most of this uh, email service providers are in either US or Europe. So that means that, um, and their compliance team usually, they usually have support team all over the world, but, but their compliance team is in US or Europe. So that means that they can only look at your case 
uh, when their, uh, their work day starts. So that means um, in, in our case, uh, we had one time where um, our customers could not send um, any emails for uh, 12 hours. And that is for like, um, for uh, merchants or e-commerce businesses, um, that is uh, a showstopper for them, right? So, um, so which is why I think um, uh, for us it is beneficial to have like two email service providers um, uh, like that we can switch to when, when one of the account is suspended. So, um, so some of the suggestions um, on implementing how, like multiple ESP is that, uh, so all of these ESP has um, APIs where you can tap into, like you can send those emails through APIs, but like the APIs are always different. And then, um, so if you need to implement like two, uh, um, like uh, two ESPs in your Rails app, for example, then you probably need to create an adapter and then um, you need to create like a, 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 a something, a layer where you can actually um, generalize all of this uh, sending of the emails. So um, what, what I suggest is that instead of using API, you go to the like lowest common denominator, which is like using SMTP. So just, um, you can just, uh, in your uh, uh, mailer, you can just set the SMTP there. Um, just set the username and, um, uh, and, the, and the authentication uh, credentials and then the, the address of the SMTP server. So using SMTP makes it easier for you to switch when, when this happens without any, um, like creating lots of codes uh, with adapters and um, using multiple ESP API. So, uh, preferably use light gems or no gems at all. So like, and um, Trigger, we're using like this small gems. Um, so we have like gems for Mailjet, SendGrid and Postmark. So what we do is that we only set the credentials in our initializers, and then um, based on which one we, we want to use at that point, which is like on the um, uh, configuration, we just set the delivery method to one of them, SendGrid or post, Postmark or MailJet. Um, so yeah, uh, or like if you're not using any gems, you can basically just have, just have like a class there um, that where you can set all of the credentials for um, uh, for for that uh, SMTP server, and just uh, use it as the delivery method options in your uh, user mailer, for example. Okay, so tips number two is that uh, you need to identify your uh, legitimate users and then try to. Um, restrict their email usage. So, uh, so this is what's, what's happening with us, I think, uh, in July. So, um, this is how much, how many emails we're sending, but at one point we start sending lots of emails. And so what we, uh, what we found out is actually the spike was caused by trial customers actually tried to invite 1,000 and 1,000 new users. And then um, like we immediately identified that, oh, these are um, spam accounts. And like one thing that we did straight away there is actually just start restricting all trial customers from um, abusing all uh, the resource. So um, for example, if uh, only for trial customers, we restrict them to like, um, in finding, I think like uh, 50 users or something like that, instead of like when, when, you're, uh, when you're a paid account then you don't have that restriction. So, um, so that's one thing that we did. So like for us, the line is between the, the trial and paid accounts. So, and, but like for, uh, for your app, it might be something else. So 
whether your user is registered or not, or whether you have like um, email confirmation or not, whether they confirm or not. So like in device, that's just pretty easy. Like you 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 have like device registrable or confirmable, and then um, yeah, like you should basically the idea here. Yeah, you should not treat your um, uh, customer the same if you cannot ver uh, verify them. So like if you if they are um, because if you have so many registrations in a day for 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 your app and um, sometimes um, some of them may, might not be um, legitimate users and we just need to make sure that those legitimate uh, non-legitimate users are not like abusing your resources so okay um the the, the third tip is that you back your email with a model. And what I mean with that is actually, uh, before I show you this, like um, you create a user and then it sends an email. But uh, what we do often in, uh, in our app is that um, you create a user and then instead of creating a user, uh, creating the email straight away, we create a user invitation model and it saves in the database and that will send an email. Um, the reason for that is that uh, having a model there allows us to, uh, to have like ad very advanced validations um, in the model. Or like if you like, if you save it into, for example, Postgres database, you can have um, validation on the, on the database itself, um, just probably to make it a more, more robust. Um, so like, what we usually do is like, for example, one trial customer is allowed to send only 10 order confirmations um, and are there no link in the subject. So like this kind of, um, <coughs> uh, this kind of validations gets harder. It's very hard if, you, if you're actually um, using like this part, like where we actually just send the email straight away and without having a track, like without tracking, um, uh, like how many emails you actually generate in a day. And then um, like probably this case um, still uh, like creation of user might block it if there's any um, invalid uh, params in there. But um, like what you should avoid is that having um, a controller where, where you know your front end can, uh, can send <coughs> an email straight away. Um, without without tracking um, uh, on your back end, like how ma how many times does does that happen? And then also like what I like about having um, a model for every emails is that uh, that become the source of truth, uh, like from your code, like how emails are generated. So most of the time you will have cases where you know you like I think I sent thousand emails, but why, why does SendGrid says, or why MailGun says, like, I sent 10,000 emails, like, where, like, where's the discrepancy coming, is coming from? So um, having that uh, makes it easy, easier for you to audit and then just to see where the leak is. Okay, so like the tips, tips number four, and this, this is something that um, we actually um, uh, experienced this recently which is like length validate your um, recipient and CC field. So uh, to give like the similar story. So this is our order, um, how many order email a day. So like this is basically the, the um, this is the weekend and this is the weekdays, uh, weekend and weekdays. Um, this happens recently, I don't know why. Uh, we need to look at that actually. <laughs> but like, um, take a look at 19th of September, September. 19th of September is just the same as other, any other days basically. So if you look at this, you probably not notice like there's nothing wrong in uh, 19th of September. But um, on 19th of September, our SendGrid account um, got uh, deactivated. The reason for that is that there's a spike on 19th of September. 
So at that day, we're sending around 300,000 emails, more than that actually. So, um, so yeah. Due to that, like our account is suspended, and then yes, yeah, so as you see, like our batch is saying, like we we, ha we haven't sent any, like that, like where's this three hundred thousand coming from? And then, but like the send grid batch says, like we're actually sending three hundred thousand um, emails. So what is happening? Why? So that is that is what that is me actually. So that's what I did <laughs> after talking to. Uh, looking at our, our metrics. But the culprit is this. So we have this email, uh, email emailing form in our app. And basically, the customer can put to there, can put the CC, and put the subject and all the message. So what happens is that um, uh, one of the trial accounts, which is most likely is a spammer account, um, they just put like 500 email address with a comma uh, in here and then also in CC and then send that to, uh, to SendGrid. So uh, that went through. So it went with one email address, we're sending 1,000, actually 1,000 emails. And they're doing it over and over and over again. So that's what happened. So what we did is after, um, after I think after 12 hours trying to figure out why 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 we're sending 300,000 email emails. Basically, the quick fix is just we validate the CCP and NCC, and then um, we're just doing like uh, using like the length. Like you you can do like I don't know try to chop the email address and then just count how many email addresses are there. But I think the thing is, um, we don't want to, do, to use like regex. And emails also have formats where you can send the name first, and then there's the parenthesis and then the email address. So it gets pretty complicated. So we're just using it, like, we're just using the, uh, the easiest um, validation. It's just like string validation. Cannot go larger than that. Like, I'm, Probably like the worst case is if someone sends a at dot a, then that's four letters, and then that's hundred something, hundred twenty-five uh, email address. Okay, so, but um, yeah, uh, like with this, we actually stop uh, those spammer accounts. Well, what's the something to, to just uh, to just spam the same I'm sorry. Because you're, you're limited the length, right? But mm -hmm. it's still technically sensitive. Yeah, so um, basically what we do, that um, we basically detect, try to detect like all this memory account and then just, um, we actually shut it down for. Um, because like we can see straight away from, from their account activity that they are actually not going to use the product or not, not going to. <laughs> Not going to pay later, so um, yeah. So we can uh, basically um, it's still uh, kind of manual right now. It's like we we have emails of like uh, uh, like all those graphs that you see earlier. Like um, our engineers get get those those graphs and can see like oh, there's like there's certain strange activity. And we need to look at it. So yeah. Um, so yeah, I think uh, like in our case, it's it's recipient and CC, but like potentially in your app, all the um, all the fields, all the attributes in your um, model, where you can where you potentially can send email to, you you need to validate those. So um, it's not sending. Um, so like you, it will not. Um, cause you to send like um, thousand emails uh, at once, and then I think um, uh, SendGrid has like a limit of thousand emails in recipients uh, field, so they actually allow that. But like I think depends on the email service provider, they might um, limit the amount of recipients um, uh, in in the email, 
And then, yeah, so this is something that you need to be very careful about um, because this can blow up your emailing costs. Like if someone can send 1,000 emails uh, at once, that means in set, like when, if you're using SendGrid, that's $1. And then if you if it goes on and on and on, it's um, in a month it can go to like um, I don't know a lot of money I guess unless um, SendGrid shut you down um, so that's that's not alternative yeah which is also not pleasant um, so uh, the last tip that I have is just like track daily usage and then set up alerts um, be be vigilant about it um, so yeah most emailing email service providers they have like basic stats and alerts so this is in SendGrid you you can um, they have stats that like how many invitation letters you're like if you set up the categories you can uh, basically uh, get the stats for every category um, category email so yeah um, so what we are doing is actually we're tracking all the email that we send. So using like the, the model that is backing the email. And then um, we're also tracking all the responses of the email. So, um, so when someone processes the email or open or it, when it bounces or market spam, um, uh, we have those data um, using. Uh, so like with SendGrid, you can get them through API as well, but um, we're using the webhooks. So, uh, so we, we, we subscribe to their web, so web hooks and every time um, those, um, those emails are being open or bounce or micro spam, then um, we get notification on our end as well. Um, yeah, so this is just a sample of code. So like using the SendGrid micro, um, you can basically just on your uh, config, you can just uh, set up the, uh, the callback there and then this is where, where you just process all the all your uh, webhook data and then save it. So what we do is actually um, using this. If we if we had um, this data before, like we validate the CC or um, recipient field, then we would have noticed that um, it was um, it was the recipient field or the CC which is causing the issues. Just because um, that means that. Um, for one email, then there will be like thousand processed um, processed uh, webhook. So yeah. Okay. So um, the conclusion is that you know transaction emails are usually very easy to set up, but um, it it is always I feel like it's always the afterthought, and you like you you just set it up and then like uh, just because it's so easy to set up, you just leave it there. But like, if you don't keep an eye on your transition emails, then you know, like your usage, um, or your costs can blow up um, in terms of like emailing. And then, yeah, these are the, the tips. Like, can go through through them again. It's like one, don't rely on one email service provider. And then, um, second, just um, segment your your users and then try to restrict them so they don't abuse um, your resources um, and then the third one is like back your email with uh, with a model so it's easier for you to track and easier to validate and then fourth one which is I think the most important one is length validate your recipient or CC field if you're sending emails and then the fifth one is like just track your daily usage and then set up alerts okay that's it any questions Um, I think this, this is start happening uh, this year. Um, like we have, we, ac we actually have uh, this like spam accounts that actually register to our site and then they are able to create an order but then probably they, they're using some kind of like um, script on uh, on their browser where they just keep like filling in random stuff and then click send and then I don't know refresh and then yeah and click send so um, yeah this is happening I think yeah, 
since this year. I think before that, we had emails with problems, uh, problems with emails as well, just because I think the content are sometimes like, so we have uh, customers who are using, like who are selling like vapes and that kind of stuff. So, and then uh, they try to send other email and then it says like, oh, there's vapes, this and that. And then they think, oh, it's, it's spam. So we used to have that, but like, like the spammers, it starts like this year, I guess. I, we haven't quite figured out why though. Yeah. In, in honesty, we have this huge problem where like people sign up to new accounts to claim the first user emails. Okay. So what we yeah. do is that we actually have a probability score mm. for like based on based on your delivery address, based on the card that you use. We have mm. like a, a updated probability score that that oh it's very probable that it's highly likely that you're doing fraud, and then yeah. we just block your block your order. So in your case, like you might do, you might, it might be a good idea to do the same thing as well, mm. where like you check like oh like the rank, the length of the 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 two the two uh, yeah. CPN, like all these like different factors, mm. and then you can update your probability discord and you can, you can block block certain accounts. Yeah, the, yeah. yeah, that's definitely a good idea. Um, I think um, I think most of the time uh, you actually. Uh, in terms of business, usually like um, usually having like false positive is a lot worse than having true negative, right? I, th I think that's for long for the longest time. That's what we're trying to like try. Uh, that's our mindset. <coughs> is like okay, we just like um, we can just handle this manually. It's not going to be that bad. But like as as you scale, that then that kind of solution. Uh, is yeah, it's appropriate. Yeah. Also with the uh, ESP, how do you switch? Do you switch as as, as in like you switch? So you mentioned earlier that mm. uh, to use some uh, multiple ESPs. Mm. Uh, how do you switch between the two? Is is the second like a backup or you? Yeah, it's uh, do you throttle. I mean, do you distribute between the two or? Yeah, it's no, it's it's just a backup. So oh. I think it just uh, when when there's a when our account gets deactivated for whatever oh, reason and then um, it is still manual at the moment okay. um, we like for our customers it's, it's very bad for, for them mm -hmm. to not be able to send emails mm -hmm. so yeah this is actually just a bit, just temporary solution for them um, while we're actually trying to figure out why why, why this thing is happening and then especially with the support of these ESPs um, yeah it, takes a long time just because of the communication um, uh, fat basically just like emailing them and then trying to figure out and then usually they they try to give you this form where you have to fill in and then you send it back and then you they get back like two hours after that so yeah um, that's a just a temporary solution for us yeah yeah uh, can you explain more about how the middleway work because the previous slide, it seemed to me that you didn't do any like authentication for the chrome experience too. Which one? The, the middleway. That, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, so this is basically just, uh, um, well, uh, just a sample code, right? but usually uh, you, you actually add the um, uh, the callback address with like a long hash, right? You just put it there, and then basically that long hash is the one that you put in in SendGrid. And um, some, uh, I think some some of the ESP uh, um, supports like authentication, so like you can basically uh, set like oh when when you send the, this web hook, send this authentication as well. Um, but yeah, like uh, usually we just put that like very long hash in here just to make sure that um, we know that it's, it's from Sandgrid. Yeah, because I, I think it's important to make sure that's from Sandgrid, otherwise other people can search for that same yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that is uh, in uh, program posts in general. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, do you detect when the email doesn't uh, the, the customer doesn't receive the email? And if you detect, for example, because the server uh, 
because of the poor reputation, the server rejects your email. What do you do then? We have seen our problem and it causes us a lot of pain because some servers just reject our IP because we were yeah. added to some blacklist. Yeah, I think this is, um, this is why email, I feel like it's an afterthought, like email reputation is very hard to build and then um, it is it's very easy to ruin, especially if, if this with these spammers. So usually what happens in those cases is that like your reputation goes down and that like, oh, you realize some of our customers are not, um, are not uh, receiving the emails. But like for those cases, I think um, we're using like subdomains for, for um, the, uh, like the emails that we're sending. So it's not like trakeco.com, but like s.trakeco.com, for example. Mm -hmm. So um, like, uh, although that might, um, that might not matter, but like we can always switch like the, the subdomains if you want. But then you still do use one IP address or do you have a pool of IP addresses that you're dedicated? Oh, at the moment, just one IP address, okay. yeah, for, for SendGrid. Um, I think that that depends on the ESP as well. Um, uh, SendGrid um, only allows one, or like, I think you can you can get more. But for example, Postmark uh, um, they they handle it on their own. So like you you basically don't need to buy IPs or um, basically warm up the IPs as well. So they they handle it on their own, which is why they are also one of the most expensive ESP out there. Yeah. So, any other questions? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, back in the day when I was in a social network, mm -hmm. working at a social network, uh, we had a specific e email validation rule for Gmails and Yahoo mails. When yeah. you put a prefix at the back, or you can switch around the dots, there was a spamming case where a long email and yes, and he registered many multiple email accounts by just moving a full stop from the first letter all the way to the last letter. Okay. So he created multiple emails, just uh, rather uh, user accounts just through that little hack. And mm -hmm. we, had a, we had a special validation just to block that kind of behavior. Okay. Have you, you, have, you guys, have you guys experienced that yet? No, we yeah. haven't. Okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a that's a possible attack vector. So mm. uh, take take note of that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. One more question: You have model for each email that you send. For example, order cancellation, order refund, etc. Just I guess that you send a lot of transactions, different transaction emails, and we have each of them backed by some model, or it's just for the most crucial one. Um, I think yeah, we we using just for the most crucial ones, like. Order is actually the most important one, mm -hmm. just because those are the ones. Like if it breaks, um, our customer suffers. But yeah, there are like um, smaller ones, like. Um, but the example, so we've got order creation mm -hmm. email, but then we've got someone cancels the order. So is order cancellation still backed by the order model, or is it a separate order cancellation model? Oh, it's a, it's a, it's an order. So like how, architecturally, how are we um, implement this? Is actually we. Um, we pull out email templates, so we have email templates um, classes where actually the content can change this. And so the, the parent model is still order email. And then order email will have email templates. Okay. And then um, uh, those, like, we don't need to create, like, for cancellation, like, one, um, yeah. one model for cancellation and um, for invoice or for shipments mm -hmm. so yeah um, yeah so I think uh, there are other like emails that we don't send quite often so for example um, like if someone wants an ACS fee or something like that um, we send emails as well that doesn't happen quite often so uh, we haven't backed it up with the model first but um, though for those those ones that can cost lots of Emails and we do have one of Okay. No more questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.